Sony BVM A-Series monitors were manufactured during the beginning of the CRT to flat panel transition. Most people in the professional monitor world had moved on to HD resolutions, but not everyone was ready to make the jump to flat panels, making these an interesting choice. Both the A-Series and the previous BVM D-Series offered input cards that allowed all options ranging from composite video to component video to HD-SDI, covering all resolutions and input formats of the time. Unfortunately, the input cards aren't interchangeable between BVM models, and to make things worse, Sony barely manufactured any of the RGB or component video cards the A-Series used, the BKM68X. Even if you were lucky enough to find one, it was ridiculously expensive and had some serious compatibility issues with certain consoles. This left A-Series owners thinking they were out of luck and stuck with something that could only be used with composite video, S-video, or just used for parts. That is, until now. I think we need to start with a bit of background. The elusive BKM68X is an input card that works in Sony A20 and A14 monitors that allows you to input RGBS, RGSB, and YPBPR component video signals in all analog video resolutions. They were so rare that they'd sell used for over $2,000 and you'd only see one or two pop up each year. On top of that, even after spending over $3,000 on both the monitor and input card, you'd often end up with sync issues due to how the card was designed. It's my speculation that since people were buying this at a time where DVD players were mainstream, and heck, even Blu-ray and HD DVD were starting to come out, Sony concentrated on supporting those products and left out any features that would help with the potential sync issues of VCRs, which are similar to sync issues from video game consoles. So basically, the A-Series BVMs offered a chance for broadcast studios and video editors to buy one of the last professional-grade CRTs Sony ever made. And this worked out for us in the retro gaming scene as well, because you'd be able to find some of these monitors in decent condition with very little hours on them compared to other monitors from the 90s and early 2000s. But even if you did find them, you couldn't usually use them as RGB monitors because of the lack of 68X input card. As a result, many people ended up parting them out. In fact, I know quite a few people that found A-series monitors in excellent condition and also found a D-series monitor in mediocre condition and was able to part them out and swap the tubes between them. That's a lot of effort and working on CRTs is always potentially dangerous, but people would end up with a D-series monitor that looked amazing and could handle all inputs, and then they'd also have an A-series monitor with a worn tube that supported composite and S-video inputs. If you had the skills to swap everything around and were able to find both monitors, it was a good choice, but pretty much the only choice for A-series owners. We also tried using different ways to get those signals in, such as converters to send 240p to the SDI and HD-SDI input cards, but the only signals we can get to pass through were 480i and 720p, not 240p or 480p, the main resolutions you'd want to use with a monitor like this. We also looked into hacking an SDI card to send RGB directly to the monitor, but that didn't work. Overall, we were told to stop trying. Smart people had already looked at the problem and deemed it impossible, so we should all just quit, right? But come on, we're nerds. There's no way we were going to quit. The community search eventually led to Martin Heinfeld, a developer working on a replacement card for the H-series BVMs and L-series PVMs. His work resulted in affordable input cards for those monitors that provided features even the originals didn't offer. Everyone was absolutely thrilled and appreciative of his work, but we all also had the same question. Could Martin do the same thing for the elusive 68X cards? Well, last year an opportunity popped up. A 68X appeared on eBay from a Brazilian retro gamer. Steve from Retrotech let me know about it, and I reached out to a few anonymous investors to see if they'd be interested in purchasing it to donate to the cause. And they both instantly said yes. Now how f 
cool is that? Two people that have never met before both decided it was okay to throw down on a project that people had deemed impossible, all for just the chance that Martin would be able to figure it out, and neither put any pressure. They were totally okay with the fact that this could be a futile effort, but did so in hopes that maybe we could have something for the community that wouldn't cost $3,000 a board. I recently did an interview with Martin where he talked about what it was like to use a logic analyzer to try and discover how this input card worked and reverse engineer it. Also, he detailed the process on his blog if anyone's interested. Basically, it was hard, but with skill, patience, and a lot of luck, he pulled it off. So now that you know the history behind this card and why it's such a big deal for owners of A-Series BVMs, let's check out its features and see how it works. Martin 68X card offers RGBS, BNC inputs and outputs, just like the original. If you're linking multiple monitors or doing something like connecting your console to the inputs and outputs to a capture card, you could leave the 75 ohm switches off. If you're only planning on using it as an input card, you could flip the 75 ohm termination switches on and only use the inputs. If you forget to flip the switch or you don't use 75 ohm terminators on the output sides, the image will be really washed out, so it's something you'd notice right away. Also, if you sometimes want to connect the output, but other times just want to use the inputs, you could leave the switches off and get 75 ohm BNC terminators exactly like you would with the original. Just leave them connected to the outputs when you're only using the inputs, and then replace them with output cables connected to another device whenever you feel like it. The only other option at the moment is the JTAG header for any software updates. I don't imagine there being many firmware updates, but if there are any and you want to update, all you would need is a cheap programmer and a PC, nothing fancy. That's pretty much it for the overview. One thing to note is the card and bracket shown here are prototypes, but pretty much the same as production versions. The only differences will be small things, like the exact fit and finish of the card when it's plugged in. You could see it's sticking out just a hair here, but production versions will be flush like the rest, and the color of the 3D print might match the rest of the monitor a little better on the production versions. Installing the card is exactly the same as the original. Make sure your BVM is unplugged and add it to the first available slot. It should slide in fairly easily, then just bolt down the bracket to hold it in place. Then power on the BVM, wait for it to boot, and set up a channel to configure. I'll press button 1 to configure that one to RGB. Now press the menu button, scroll down to Input Configuration, and hit Enter. Then select Format, Component, and RGB. After you hit Enter, it'll bring you back to the Input menu. Now just make sure it's set to the aspect ratio of the monitor. This one's 4x3, but if you have an A24 or an A32, it would be 16x9. Then set the scan size to normal and the sync mode to external. Now I'll power on an RGBS source and make sure it works. If not, you might still need to toggle the sync button or go back and double check your settings. A few things to note here. First, when you change sources, you'll see that the on-screen display says 480i. All PVMs and BVMs do this, and all that means is it's detecting a 15 kHz signal, which is what both 240p and 480i are. I know that's kind of a beginner tip, but it's a question I often get, and some people think that the resolution might be set wrong, but I wanted to let everybody know it's fine. Next, the monitor I'm using here is a loner with really bad burn-in, so you'll have to excuse the quality. I have another monitor that I got halfway through shooting this video, so I'll have footage of both, but if you see any terrible burning on the screen, it's just this particular tube, not anything to do with the card or the A-series monitors in general. Anyway, now we'll configure input 2 as component video, YPBPR. This is the same exact process, but you'll want to set it to internal sync mode, as component video doesn't use the fourth BNC wire. And that's it! Now if you switch between a component video and RGB source, you'll just need to toggle channel inputs. Okay, now that it's set up, let's check out how it works. I didn't have a second A-series available or a 68X, so I'll use a BVM D9H as those have the same exact sync issues as the 68X. What you're seeing on the little monitor is exactly what you'd see with the original 68X card on the A-series monitors. Let's start with the most problematic console I've seen with the A-series BVMs, the Sega Master System. As you can see, unlike the original card, SMSs sync perfectly. 
Okay, before we go any farther, we have to take a moment to reflect on this. Not only is this card something that's going to be infinitely more affordable than the original, and something you could actually purchase, especially after part shortages are over, but it's going to perform better than the original. So overall, this is just a huge deal for BVM fans in the retro gaming community. Okay, now onto the Dreamcast using a retro access SCART cable in 15 kHz mode. It looks perfect on Martin's card with a tiny bit of sync curl on the original. That wouldn't have been a deal breaker for original 68X owners, but it's worth noting the compatibility difference. Next is that same setup with the retro access cable in 31 kHz mode. The 480p signal looks fine on both monitors, and this is credited to the custom sync combiner circuit Dan Kuntz from PixelFX designed for it. Here's where things get interesting though. Using the Dreamcast with a standard VGA cable through the HD15 to SCART has bad sync issues on the original, and still has a little bit of issues on Martin's as well. This is more to do with the Dreamcast's odd signal and not the monitor, but I thought it was worth mentioning, both for people with this exact setup or for people using the HD15 to SCART with other VGA devices. It should be totally safe to try, but these monitors are weird and not all VGA sources will work. I'd still call this a minor issue that's still playable, but definitely annoying. I think you'll have good results with almost all 480p sources though. It might only get weird with things like old computers or things with weird sync issues. Next we have a Neo Geo AES with a problematic motherboard revision, the 3.6. It seems to work fine on both, however I have heard people say they had Neo Geo issues with their original 68X. I tried this as well as the OpenMVS and both look great, so I'm not really sure what to say about people who had problems on their original, but it might have to do with region or some other factor that I don't have the ability to test. After that we have PC Engine and TurboGrafx-16. This console has a lot of compatibility issues, but as you can see, it works perfectly with Martin's card. I think this might be a bigger deal than the Sega Master System, but that's up to you. Either way, I'm sure everybody's happy to see it working. Okay, now let's try some arcade boards. First, we have the Simpsons, which always had sync issues on the original, but looks fine here. Next, here's Ultimate Mortal Kombat 3 with the Plus upgrade. Looking good on Martin's card, but you can see the sync issues in the life bar on the original. And lastly, CPS1 is the same. Great on Martin's card, but has bad sync issues on the original. I could probably dig out some more consoles and boards, but hopefully by now you get it. BVMs are notoriously more picky than PVMs, but overall Martin's card performs significantly better than the original for classic game consoles. So if you have an A-series BVM without an RGB card, buying this is a no-brainer. It's expensive, but infinitely cheaper than the original, and you could actually buy it. We do need to talk about price, though. The 2021 version of the card is going to be coming in under $300, and that's for two reasons, both directly related to the part shortage. First, the board requires an FPGA, which are all hard to come by these days. In fact, the one Martin used in testing isn't available at all until next year, and the only alternative is a much more expensive version of the chip. That's also being hit with a part shortage. Martin spoke to Ryan from Castlemania Games, who will be manufacturing these cards, and they had to make a decision. Do we release the card now with the more expensive FPGA and the much higher price, or do we wait until the part shortage is over, you could use the cheaper FPGA, and possibly even other components would be cheaper as well. I strongly believe that every A-series owner out there who doesn't have the 68X would be jumping up and down screaming and yelling if we didn't release the card as is, and I think most people would be happy to spend the extra price knowing that the alternative is to either not have a card at all or spend probably more than you spent on the monitor just for the input card. There's one more factor as well. The 129X replacement project was out for about a year before a large run of production was made. This allowed the design to be tweaked and tested on many monitors, and two small bugs in the design were fixed before a large production was made. Alternatively, the test group we had for A-series monitors was much smaller, and we think we have all the bugs worked out, but can't be sure. As a result, the decision was made to make a small run of boards, specifically for early adopters. I strongly feel that A-series owners without an RGB card will be more than happy to buy this right away, even as an early adopter with a higher cost. 
In fact, these will probably sell out pretty quick to that exact group of people because they all see the other side, a $2,500 to $3,000 card that you probably can't even get. If you already have a 68X in your A-Series, I'm not sure if this is the right time to buy. We're still working on a box to fix the sync issues with all BVM monitors, and while there's no time frame for release, now that the 68 project is finished, we can get back to testing that one. If your monitor's already working, you might want to wait for that, or wait until mid next year to get the cheaper next run of production. Either way, I'm thrilled that this issue has been solved, and I want to thank Martin once again for all his hard work. This project is open source and people are welcome to fork it to build replacement cards for other Sony monitors as well. You should just know that reverse engineering will have to start from scratch with each monitor revision though, so it's not an easy task. Please check out the interview we did as well as the links in the description for a lot more info on this card and how the process was done. Well, that's it for this time. Please subscribe to this channel and see what else we have to offer. Also, check out the weekly podcast that keeps everyone in the loop of everything going on in the retro gaming scene, available as a video and everywhere audio podcasts are found. Thanks, and I'll see you next time.